So I'm a little over halfway through this documentary series. What I like the most is how much they flesh out these different big names that you've heard these names a uh, hundred times, Goebbels, Himmler, but sometimes they're just names for you and you can see the Nazis as kind of a monolith and they're all kind of the same. They all had similar self, they all had similar interests, they all had similar beliefs, ideologies, but really it's not. That's not true of really any group and this documentary does a great job fleshing out these different characters and you really start to see the differences between them where they got along and where they had their conflict the only person they don't really flesh out and you don't really get to know is hitler which makes sense because it's called hitler circle of evil so it's about the people around him now last thing i'll say before i get into it i recently watched babylon berlin that's also on netflix it's really interesting because it's covering roughly the same period at least of the early episodes of this documentary is the Weimar period. So it's interesting to compare the actual do documentary and historical figures versus the fictionalized portrayal of it is very interesting. So what I'm gonna do in this video is I'm gonna talk about the most interesting things that I found in the documentary, but I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna group it by people. So in the documentary, they do it chronologically and they start and they take you through the period leading up to the war and then the period towards the end of the war. I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna clump all the people together. I'm gonna to try to do the people in order of when they first arise and leave but I'm gonna clump all the important facts about different people together. Hopefully that does an even better job of making you really feel like you understand the different big players in the pre-war era. So who was part of Hitler's inner circle that was there right from the beginning, right from when Hitler first started getting into politics? We have Rudolf Hess, we have Himmler, we have Goering, and we have um, uh, Rome to an extent, um, Ernst Rome. And then we have Dietrich Eckhart. Now I'm gonna start with him because he's kind of the first actually to link up with Hitler, but he's also the first to leave. So it's good to start with him. So in at this time in Germany, we have Berlin, which is the capital. This is kind of the liberal, kind of the, the establishment right now with the Weimar Republic. And now we have the South, Munich. And this is where all the, the activism is, the radicalism, the extremism, and especially in these beer halls. And this is where we get the beer hall push very famously later. So in Munich, in Bavaria, we get Dietrich Eckhart. Now he's just a poet and he likes mysticism. He likes these theories about Atlantis and how Aryans, they're this race from Atlantis and the Tool Society. This is where we get the swastika. It was actually originally this, this spiritual symbol. So Eckhart, and we see this in his writing, he starts writing about a messiah, someone who's gonna lead the German people out of this era of humiliation. And then he sees Hitler in these beer halls, giving these speeches, and he sees what an orator Hitler is, how he has the ability to rabble rouse, and he takes him under his wing. And he starts bringing him, um, Eckhart has a lot of connections with the elite and the intellectual figures. And he starts bringing Hitler to these parties. Now Hitler doesn't always have the best manners. Sometimes is a little, um, not socially awkward, but he goes on these rants about, you know, the Jewish conspiracy and not everyone at the party is, you know, in agreement. So there's this kind of oddball relationship that forms with Eckhart as the mentor and Hitler as this person that he, he wants to kind of be puppet master and this kind of spiritual advisor to Hitler. But anyways, Hitler and Eckhart, they actually have a falling out fairly early on, but nonetheless, Hitler still praises Eckhart throughout his life, in his writings, in his speeches, as kind of the spiritual father to Nazism. So he's a very important figure during Hitler's formative years. And oddly enough, Eckhart, he accuses Hitler of having the Messiah complex. And it's funny because Eckhart was probably the primary one responsible for fostering and encouraging this Messiah complex in the first place. Now, the second person we'll talk about briefly is Rudolf Hess. So when Hitler is giving these speeches in these Munich beer halls, Rudolf Hess is a young, idealistic, very interested in the mysticism, and he hears Hitler speaking. What's interesting about Hess, everyone else around Hitler seemed to be using Hitler to some extent for their own personal power. They wanted to use Hitler to stir up the masses. They wanted to use Hitler for something. Rudolf Hess never seemed to want to use Hitler for anything. He just seemed to really adore and love Hitler and believe in everything he said. Rudolf Hess was in some ways the most loyal, the most devoted of everyone. And it's kind of tragic what happens to him, we find out later, but this is how it originally started, where he just, he honestly was a true believer and everyone else, they seemed to be interested in the esoterica and the this occult stuff. They were interested in it largely because they thought it was useful to manipulate people. They thought it was interesting way to communicate ideas. Rudolf Hess seemed to actually believe that all this stuff was actually true. And in some ways, a lot of people thought he was crazy because he seemed to actually believe all this crazy stuff that other people, of course, they dabbled in. They would read these books and read these theories, but 
I think they all kind of understood on some level, well, it's not technically true, we just, we like talking about it. No, Rudolf Hess actually believed it. So Rudolf Hess is another person who leaves Hitler's inner circle relatively early. He sticks around till about right before the war. He makes this last ditch effort to stop the war by flying to London. But he's still very important because this whole idea of Lebensraum, living space, expansion, that really comes from him, actually, and these kind of mythical readings. I think it was Haushofer that he first got this idea from. But anyways, we'll get to another major figure who was there right from the beginning, Hermann Goering. Now, how to remember him, he is a fighter pilot, not just any fire pilot, a very decorated fire, fighter pilot with a lot of medals, very decorated, and then also very overweight. You hear this mentioned all the time that he was this great big presence that was made all the bigger by he would always wear his full military uniform all these uh, all these medical and medals and all this pomp and circumstance so world war one ends and Goering he's very upset because he feels like the politicians they sold out the soldiers and it wasn't the soldiers that lost the war it was the politicians back at home he also he's disrespected he's walking around and these socialists these new socialist thugs they beat him up they spit on his uniform and disrespect the uniform and he's reduced to being the stunt pilot and traveling around and him as someone who was this decorated war hero, he feels a great resentment, and this is how he so easily gets swept up into this new radical movement. So he is actually part of the famous beer hall putsch that fails. He actually gets shot, and he flees, and he's in exile, he's wounded, and to deal with the pain from him getting shot in this putsch, he actually starts taking morphine, and this becomes something he kind of battles with his whole life, this morphine addiction. And at this point, Goering was actually the head of the SA. Now remember the SA, that's headed up by Rome, who will forever be known in history as the gay Nazi. And the SA, they're very thuggish, street violence, and this was kind of the initial force that propelled the Nazis into power. But then the Nazis were kind of, once they got the power, kind of embarrassed by them and eventually purged them out. Now, Goering was still the head of this, but... Rome wanted to be the head, so Rome comes to Goering in exile, basically wrests power away from him, and at this point, Goering, he's penniless, he has no money, he's in exile, he's addicted to morphine. This is a very low point, and no one really likes Goering, because he's not as anti-Semitic, none of the other Nazis, the high-powered Nazis, really like Goering, because he's not very anti-Semitic, he had, I think it was an uncle or something that was a Jew, so he's not anti-Semitic, he's also very kind of the old conservative guard, all these new Nazis, they're very radical, very, this kind of new political movement. So no one likes Goering, but nonetheless, when the Nazis shift from wanting to get power through violence to wanting to use politics and have legitimacy, they recognize Goering as this member of the old elite, as this kind of very decorated fire pilot, f fire, fighter pilot, I struggle with that word. They recognize he can give them this kind of legitimacy. So they go and they bring him back. And he gets this, what seems like a relatively minor post as the head of the police in Munich, in Bavaria. But what this actually does is it gives him access to all the files on all these different Nazis. Because remember, before the Nazis were in power, they were this almost terrorist group that the government really didn't like. So the government, the police, they would collect information on all these now very powerful Nazi leaders. So when Goering gets the post of being the head of the police, he gets all these files. So suddenly Goering is in this position of great power, and the Gestapo, this isn't the SS, so the SS is Himmler, he's in charge of the Gestapo, and this is the secret police, think of wiretaps, and he's also, being the head of the police, he's able to wiretap people, and he uses this to great advantage, he listens to their conversations, and then when he's talking to them, he'll use an exact phrase that they used on the phone with someone else to just kind of freak them out, so Goering, very interesting story, he goes from being in exile, kind of out of nowhere, a few things change and all of a sudden he's one of the, mo the most powerful people in the Nazi party. Okay, so another major figure who is there right from the beginning, Heinrich Himmler. Now, Himmler, a couple things to distinguish him, very young. They keep mentioning that in the documentary. He's very young, very ambitious, very organized, very methodical, very able to get things done, really a bureaucrat. And you see this used to tragic effect later during the Holocaust. And then the other major thing with Himmler is the SS was really his brainchild. Now, since he was so young, he missed out on World War I. Unlike most of these other Nazis, they did serve in World War I. He didn't. He missed his chance. So he always felt this want to prove himself to really be a military guy. So he used the SS and how to distinguish from the SA. Think of the S SA kind of the rabble, kind of thugs, the street violence. The SS was this elite, very pure, like the requirements to get in as far as racial purity were incredibly high, very disciplined, very sleek. Um, Hugo Boss, yes, that Hugo Boss designed all their uniforms. So think of this as, as Himmler's desire to create an almost hyper-efficient military 
unit. Again, very different than than uh, Rom's SA, which was kind of loadish, degenerate, kind of just uh, boisterous, boorish. So let's get to Ernst Rom, the head of the SA. Now he's always been kind of on the wrong side of the law, right from when the Nazis were first becoming this radical movement. He was the one who would smuggle in arms, have these kind of paramilitary groups that were out of the outside of the government's purview. So when the Nazis started trying to become more legitimate and achieve power through legitimate means, Hitler and Rom had this falling out because Rom still wanted to do all these kind of illegal activities. And Hitler said, look, I want to, I'm trying to get parole. He was in prison at the time from the Beer Hall Putsch. He just wanted to get parole. So he's trying to be um, on his best behavior. So he actually had a big falling out with Rom and Rom left and was in this kind of self-imposed exile. Himmler was the one who eventually, they wanted someone to lead the SA. So Himmler was the one who actually brought Rom back from exile. But then interestingly enough, Himmler was one of the biggest ones who immediately turned on Rom and led to the Night of Long Knives where Rom and his SA were purged. And Himmler and others went to Hitler and said, look, Rom, with his thuggery and with his homosexuality and his depravity, he's corrupting the Hitler youth. They actually used this and they said, look, Rom is corrupting the youth. So that was kind of what led to Rom's downfall. So I'm gonna end the video there because it's getting long. I actually don't know how long the videos can be before you have to split them up. I'm pretty new on YouTube. I don't know if I have the privilege to make these really long videos. So I'm gonna end it there. But once I finish the series, I will make another video and I'll include all the stuff I didn't. I didn't even touch on Goebbels yet. Really interesting stuff with him. So um, I will link in the description um, that video once it comes out. So between the two of them, you should get most of, again, the major, the major power players in this very interesting period in history.